This podcast is sponsored by the Music Player Network at musicplayer.com, the premier musician resource for keyboard players and beyond. Since the year 2000, the Music Player Network has been the go-to source for news and views on music technology, playing tips, and gigging help. The Keyboard Corner is one of the longest-running keyboard forums in Internet history, with guitar, bass, drum, and numerous recording and music tech forums also on offer. Frequented by weekend warriors, manufacturers' representatives, and professionals alike, MPN provides an invaluable resource for any musician, and it's 100% free to sign up and use. Go to www.musicplayer.com to see for yourself. Welcome to episode 34 of the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and it's great as always to be here with you. Uh, my esteemed co-host, Paul, continues to be out on the road with his band, and uh, I've heard dispatches from the road that he's having a ball, and um, they're getting great audiences, which are well-deserved. Um, if you are Australia-based, I'm going to check out Echoes of Pink Floyd is a, a very, very worthwhile experience. Um, today, while Paul's away, though, I'm very thrilled to be speaking with Michael Whalen. So with Michael, aside from his two Emmy Awards and eight Emmy nominations for his huge career in film and TV, Michael still manages to find to t- the time to engage in some very cool musical collaborations and even runs his own record label. And then just for fun, he's an adjunct professor and go-to guy for his expertise on digital rights and copyright law. As you can imagine, that combination makes for a very broad-ranging discussion Uh, and I think you'll enjoy it a great deal. Hi, Michael. Thanks so much for joining us. Now, I quite often um, say to kick off, oh, look, how are you keeping busy, Michael? But having done... Uh, a lot of research into your career so far. I, I actually thought I'd kick off with a new question, was, uh, which is, how the hell do you not need a holiday? <laughs> oh, so David, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. It is a pleasure. I am a fan. Uh, it's great to be here. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of people ask me that about about my sort of productivity. And one of the things that I say is it's all about schedule. And, you know, because I think everyone has this um, this sort of cliche that artists are all kind of like walking in the dark and we're looking for inspiration and it happens when it happens. That's not true. No, I think I think the best artists actually create their own opportunities to be creative. And so what I do is I actually make time every day to write. I make time every day to do social media, I make time every day to, to like maintain what I need to. And then I have free time and I walk the dog and I do other things and whatever. But I think having structured time where it's like, look, I've got two hours to make this happen. And if it doesn't happen, now I'm not going to force it necessarily, but I am going to give myself the time because one of the things that happens is you start talking to people and they're like, well, wow, Michael, you know, if I only had the time, I would do yes. X. No, I like I like that a lot, and um, there's plenty of science to support that. Uh, Michael, just as an aside, I just finished reading a book called Deep Work, which whose premise was exactly that. It's about setting aside the time to do the deep work. In this case, creativity, and it obviously pays off for you. Yeah, no, no. I mean, and I and I think there is actually a, and I know this is going to sound antithetical. I know this is going to sound paradoxical, but if you can schedule your creativity you can start getting a handle on when it happens. Now, I have been doing this for a long time. So like if somebody goes and does this next week and they write to you and say, hey, David, that guy Michael Whalen told me this thing and it didn't work, you gotta give it some time. So maybe the way to do it is like if you're a writer or a music person or if you're into video or something, one of, some other creative thing, give yourself 20 minutes a day to say, hey, I'm going to set aside this 20 minutes to do 
a page of a screenplay or I'm going to like write eight bars of a song or something like that and give yourself like a task. And what's going to happen is you will start drawing on things that you've never drawn on before. Mm. So that is the, that's the beginning of the answer to your question. Like, how do I not need a holiday? Yes. That's right. And uh, it seems to me you're making a fairly um, uh, unusual claim that creativity involves some discipline, Michael. Is this serious? Well, I, I, I mean, you know, I mean, this idea that you're going to get up and you're going to be half looped with marijuana or alcohol and be like, oh, David, yeah, I'm free to be creative and whatever. I think that is, you know, bollocks. I think that's ridiculous. I think it's stupid. I mean, I think, I mean, honestly, the best work that I've ever done has been inside of what I would call a self-limiting system, which means I give myself very specific parameters musically, and I give myself a very finite amount of time, and my brain has to go to work. And what I've done is I say, okay, so let's take the example of like a string quartet. you got two violins, a viola, and a cello. Yeah. And you say, okay, I'm going to write a movement of a string quartet in a week. Now, under normal circumstances, people would be like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. Okay, great. What if you actually did that? And you said, okay, great. I'm going to set aside three hours a day over seven days. That's 21 hours to actually create the framework, maybe not finished, like completed, like done, ready to play, but certainly like the framework for a movement of a string quartet. Absolutely possible in 21 hours. Mm. Absolutely. So I'm, uh, and I want to get onto your film and TV work. I'm guessing that's part of the reason you've you've had so much um, success in that area, but we'll get onto that. But I thought we might um, start with the present and that's your current project um future shock and i've spent quite a bit of time a looking at the um latest video clip and then listening through um your your back catalog just with um future shock and it's incredible so um do you want to talk us about the genesis of that and there's a few um young up-and-comers involved in that band i believe well, well, you know, up and comers, yeah. So, like, so I'm the up and comer in my own band. <laughs> so, so, so the band is uh, this unknown keyboard player named Michael Whalen, and then there's a drummer named Simon Phillips. Who, if you don't know him, he's played with a couple of people like Toto and uh, the Who and Jeff Beck and a bunch of other people, um, and he has his own band. Um, prototype, which is just incredible. Yeah. Calling it jazz fusion isn't even close. It's like, I mean, Philip is putting so much stuff into a blender and then he hits liquefy and then whatever <laughs> comes out is like this. I, I, I don't even know what to call it. But anyway, but Philip is the most wonderful, most professional. Like, like one of the one of the greatest experiences I've ever had in working with a musician because, like, you give him stuff and he's like, okay, I got some ideas, and then he just starts hitting you with stuff, and 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 when this record was made was September, October, and November of last year when we were like at the pinnacle of the lockdown, yeah. and you know, so the idea was. Okay, well, I, I'm going to go do this, I don't know, jazz, in quotations, record, and we'll see what happens. Um, and, you know, he said to me, well, what are you going to do with bass? And I said, well, you know, I've worked with Tony Levin a bunch of times. Maybe Tony's busy. Maybe he's not. I don't know. But the thing that's weird, David, is like during, you know, the pandemic, everyone was home. Yes you'd ring up anybody and they're home <laughs> and hey i got a thing you got a minute you got a day you got a week you got some stuff and whatever so i have stuff that i've been recording over the last year and a half because everybody is just home and so now you know things are beginning to loosen up a little bit and things are you know things are beginning to move and people are starting to go on tour again and whatever so it's getting a, it's getting more difficult but there was about 12 to 14 months where you'd call anybody and they would be home. Exactly. And so Future Shock is really a product of um, of a, a couple of things. The first of all was, you know, I've done a, what I would call sort of jazz fusion or jazz sort of progressive music, whatever, for a long time. But I wanted to kind of 
sort of codify it inside of the new vocabulary that I've created. I did a record last year called Sacred Spaces, which mm. was all over the place. Uh, it was incredibly well reviewed. People were very nice about it. But one of the things that I, I have done is that instead of sort of being one of these composers who's sort of pretending to be a pianist and whatever, I've really, really, really uh, committed myself to being a synthesist mm -hmm. and being a sound. And so Sacred Spaces was me so, sort of saying to everybody, okay, I'm a sound designer. And then I did this really beautiful meditative record last year, actually while I was recovering from COVID called Karmic Dreams, which also benefited from that. And then I've been on this crazy sound design thing. So Future Shock really has come out of a huge explosion of creativity and uh, creating a lot of sounds and me loving jazz fusion music. I love Weather Report. I love Joe Zywell and all. I love the fusion of synthesis and jazz and world music and rock and, and metal mm -hmm. and all of it put together. And so for me, um, like pulling on a lot of things simultaneously just made sense. Absolutely, and and it certainly came together beautifully. I mean, some of the sounds on that that uh, record are incredible. And I mean, just even the video and the memories of you song, just absolutely brilliant. I think I've watched it ten or twelve times. Just it's the you've even set the videos up beautifully, and um, highly recommended people, highly recommended. Um, Thank you. Um, and I'd just like to congratulate you. You're now the second person on the show to have had COVID. So well done. Well, you know, I, I mean, you know, the, it is a small club, you know, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a VIP situation. So, and, and, you know, and you're welcome. The COVID <laughs> synthesis of the world. Congratulations. Oh. You're now vice president. Um, yeah, we had um, um, Al. I, it, it, it is, and by the way, if you haven't had COVID and you've heard people complain about it, guys, it, it's terrible. It's terrible with a capital T, and I had a really mild case. Yeah, and it's the sickest I've ever been. Yeah, no, it's like it's the sickest I've ever been ever. And the weird thing was, I had major surgery January this year, and I'm lying in my bed in the hospital, and I'm having all kinds of weird body aches, and and my doctor comes by, wonderful doctor, and I say, "Wow, my body's hurting. Like, what's going on?" He's like, "That's not me. That's COVID." Yeah. Yeah, no, it's not a good thing, and hopefully we're starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel, even from a musical, selfish musical viewpoint. Hopefully we're seeing totally. a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. So let's let's go to the other end of the tunnel, uh, which is when you started out, um, and uh, so just have a bit of a cast back. What what actually got you into full time professional musicianship and composition? So I started with drums. As a, you know, and I could I could do sort of a long sort of monologue on that, but I will not bore your people with that. But at a certain point in my life, I had a wonderful teacher named Tommy Ward, uh, Tommy Wardall, and and Tommy said to me, and Tommy was the chief percussionist of the Kennedy Center. Wow. And um, and I was growing up in Washington D.C., you know, here in America, and. Uh, and I was really committed to being a great percussionist and I was going to play timpani and, a, you know, marimba and everything. And he's like, Michael, you're incredibly talented, but you have a talent for composition. And I will never forget this. He said, don't be me. Don't be the guy w waiting in the pit for the guy in front of you to either die or leave. Yeah. He's like, as a composer, you will actually have control over your life. He's like, so I am telling you to go follow that rung versus like, go be a guy in the pit doing the thing. And, you know, and, you know, yes, you've got your salary and you've got your pension and they do the thing and whatever. And so being a composer is probably being more out on the skinny branches. Mm. But in the end of the day, you have more control over your life. And that's that's when it happened. Okay, well, and and I, I I'm saying I believe you would think that was good advice in retrospect. Well, I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, having taught a bunch of people, having, you know, taught at four different universities and had lots of students, I think what he gave me was incredibly courageous advice. Mm. But I think that I but I think it was um, incredibly well timed. I remember <laughs> I remember getting back in the car 
with my mom, you know, my mom would pick me up and, you know, drive me home. And I, I would say, mom, Tommy said I shouldn't be a drummer. I should go be a composer. And she's like, <laughs> he's crazy. What are you talking about? And so, you know, so we're having an argument in the car for the next 20 minutes. So, I mean, you know, I, 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 the thing is, is that, you know, I know as a parent, I have two amazing kids. Mm. You know, they're my, my, my daughter's about to go to, you know, uh, get her master's degree in London. And wow. my son is in college. And it's, it, it, it's great. And I know as a parent, you know, you want to try to protect your children. But I think the best thing you can do is empower the dreams they have, even if they sound crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's a brilliant piece of advice. Um and that obviously, as I said, it obviously paid off for you. So, um, Mike, what got what got you that first, uh, in quotation marks, real c- composing job? So, uh, there, there there was sort of a couple of sort of steps to this, but um, when I was twenty, I moved from Washington D.C. to New York, and through my family and a few other things, I got a job as an intern at the biggest commercial music house in the world. So there was a place on 20th Street in New York City called Elias Associates. And at that point, Elias Associates was doing between four and 500 commercials a year, music for four or 500 commercials a year. Plus, John Elias was also a record producer. So at that time, he was producing Duran Duran and Grace Jones, and he was doing all all kinds of different stuff. And he was doing movies and all kinds of stuff. So like falling into this as an intern in the middle of this chaos. (laughs) And and Davis, when when I say chaos, I mean, Chaos, like with a capital K. I mean, chaos, you know, (laughs) I mean, like it it, it was crazy time. But I mean, but uh, the very first thing that happened was one of the staff composers got sick. And a Pepsi commercial came in with a guy named Michael J. Fox, which people may know, (laughs) who's a big movie actor and a Pepsi commercial came in and they said, Hey, we'll give it to Michael because I had done a bunch of stuff for John for records and stuff like that. So I did it. The agency loved it. And that was literally the first commercial I did. Wow. That's a good way to start off. So, so if you want to start, if so, so if you're a mountain climber, you sort of start at the, you sort of, you, you sort of start on the summit with, you know, Mount Everest. Yeah. And, and so, um, and for the next, 18 months, like I did a lot of work. I worked with John. Uh, when he produced Duran Duran, I was in the studio every day with Duran Duran for six months. I have stories that will not stop uh, <laughs> about that experience. Like, oh my God, but the uh, the guys from Duran Duran, I love them and they're great. And um, I learned a lot about how to produce records and how to actually empower artists. And uh, it, was, it was a really cool experience. And then... Um, in uh, 1989, I left and I became a freelancer and I started working with like every music house in New York. And then I did my first television in 1990. And since 1990, I've done almost 900 TV shows. Yeah, wow. It's, it's certainly, as you said, it's when, you, when you start from Everest, it's it sort of, I'm not saying it would ever be easy, but it certainly gave you that kickoff. Um, and, and back then, Michael, and I don't mean back then as in it was 100 years ago, but back then in working in a, a house like Elias, what was the process of actually composing? Where you had studios, you were literally scoring to paper. What, what were you doing? So, um, so their main sequencer was the Sinclair. So oh, I learned. I, I, so I learned, so they had Studio A and Studio B, and they had Sinclavirs in them. And then Studio C, they had Performer or some, you know, nonsense or whatever. But basically, you tried as hard as you could to be in Studio B because John was always in Studio A. <laughs> and so, l- long story short, like, um, that's where I learned how to, to use the Sinclavir. And then in 1989, I met the woman, my first wife, who... I was going to marry. And then in 1990, I convinced her poor father to co-sign a loan so I could buy my first single wow. and which was $225,000. Thank you very much. Wow. And, um, so uh, I, I did that. And then I paid the loan back in, I think, like 18 months or yeah, something. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, like, I mean, I mean, not to sort of sound braggy, but like I was doing three and four commercials a day. Yeah. 
So, I mean, you know, so and like in, you know, so if a fee was going to be somewhere between eight and twelve thousand dollars, you're making, I don't know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a day. That's right. Yeah. And then you have residuals and then you have other things that are happening. I mean, I mean, to say that it was crazy town is not even close to an exaggeration. No. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that answered the question. So Studio and Sinclavius, and um, I didn't realise they were that quite that expensive. I, I'm aware of Fairlight's been Australia based, and I knew they were forty, fifty, sixty thousand. I had no idea Sinclavius were that expensive. Wow. Yeah, well, I mean, because the other thing to see, the thing that got crazy wasn't the actual like enclosure; it was buying the memory. Yeah. Hey buy more voices or more ram and so we'd say hey i want <laughs> you know david we live in a world now where so we're like i want a terabyte of That's ram right. and it costs us like 60 dollars us or something right you know back in those days if i wanted i don't know 32 meg of ram it was going to cost me five thousand dollars yeah ten thousand dollars it was like it was like some crazy amount of money um and then at a certain point um, in the late, well, let's call it like 1998, um, I bought a system from a guy named Herb Pillhofer, who was a huge sort of jingle sound, sound okay. design guy from Minneapolis, um, and uh, bought a huge system. And then I bought part of Frank Zappa's system after Frank wow. died. And so at that point, I had pretty close to the largest Sinclair system in the world. And then Gail let me, Gail Zappa let me buy part of Frank's library. So I had about five or 6,000 of Frank's sounds. Jeez. And so he had all this stuff with the Ensemble Modern doing these things called evolvers. So Frank would say to, I don't know, 25 musicians, here, play an E, a unison. And then he'd start moving his hands up and down, and then they were all like gonna like move off the note, like up and down and do pitch bends and effects and stuff based on like how his hands were moving around. And these samples would go on for minutes. Wow. So you'd hold the note down like on an E and you'd just be like, I can't believe what's happening with this. Yeah. Like like, like the library is just insanity. It's like total insanity, these sounds and um, you know, and so the Frank stuff I used very, 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 very sparing, sparingly, but I also think it taught me a lot about what you could do about making electronic music feel more organic. Yes. And, it, and, it, and, and the word is, it's one word, and the word is performance. Like, how do you put performance and articulation and that sort of organic thing into it such that you're not you're not present to sort of the cold sort of technology sort of microchip part of it you're much more inside of like you know this was like played and articulated by someone that's right yeah that's no, that's amazing and and so do you do you still have all the Sinclair gear and and zappers I do. sample i don't have all the i have i don't have all the Sinclair gear at one point i had five systems wow. i had I had a system in LA, I had a system in Boston, I had a system in New York. It was nuts. Anyway, so I have one little tiny system and then I have uh, a hard drive with all of the stuff converted over so now right. I can feed all of that stuff in contact and logic and a couple of other things. So there you go. And some of that, you know, the Zappa stuff and maybe some of your stuff, that needs to be in the National Library of Congress or something one day. Well, it, 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 it's really true. I mean, you know, and I, and I think the Zappa people have really done a great job in terms of actually archiving his stuff. Um, and, you know, he has such an unbelievable library. I mean, I don't think people realize that um, really from, let's say, I don't know, like the late 70s through like the early 90s, he did a multi-track recording of every live performance he ever oh, did. Oh, wow. Okay. And so I don't think people understand, like, there is thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of unreleased Zappa out there. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. release the Zappa, I say, but yeah, I know. Exactly. Um, and look, just for the sake of our listeners, if you, you're already screaming um, at your... Um, player of choice. What about the Duran Duran stories? We don't have time. I like uh, well, Michael. That's another whole thing. I'm going to tell you one. Okay, I'm going to tell you one story that will not get me in trouble with the band. Okay. How's that? Okay. Yeah. 
So, at, okay. So at some point in the process, sir, pretty early on, um, uh, girls in New York City figured that Duran Duran were at Elias Associates, which was at six. Oh, uh, wow. e, uh, sorry, six West Twentieth Street, and I'm I'm giving you the dress because they're not there anymore. Yeah. So they were at six West Twentieth Street, uh, and at a certain point there was police and a police barricade with hundreds of girls waiting outside all day long every day. Wow, and so. This is how crazy it got, and I'm I'll, I'll, I'm going to do this in like sort of like the least sort of offensive way possible. The girls figured that I was working with the band; they had gotten some sort of insight, and I would walk into the building, and the girls would literally say, "I will do anything <laughs> to you, so I can meet the band." <laughs> Michael, yeah, okay, that's yeah. So that sure that is like the short sort of like PG version of. <laughs> a way worse story. So there you go. And as much as I'd love to, I'm not going to ask the follow-up questions to that, but that that is a brilliant story. There you go. <laughs> so, so you asked. I there you go. That, I mean, you... but I, I, I literally have hundreds of stories that I cannot tell you on the air. So no, I and understand that. And just, I mean, Nick Rhodes <laughs> is on my bucket list of guests on this show as well. So I, I funnily enough, I only approached his uh, management. I can't remember how in the last sort of 10 days. So it's funny that you brought them up. I mean, I mean, and the thing is, is that I mean, I you know, I I think Nick is a very misunderstood person in the sort of synth land. I think he is an incredibly underrated guy. Yeah. I think he is a very, very great musician, and I think instinctively he is a guy who understands what is needed and what is not needed. That's right. And. And I, and he has a way of editing himself without any ego or any anything in a way that uh, I think a lot of people can learn from. So I have a lot of respect for Nick, and I'm happy that I spent time with him. He's a great guy. I spent a lot of time with John. I spent a lot of time with Simon. But Nick is a great guy, and I have a lot of respect for him. Yeah, no, absolutely. And they're still going so strong. I mean, they're, they're yeah, single. the new song. Yeah, it's brilliant. Great. And the with the AI great. video clip, it's just amazing. Yeah. It's terrific. I, and, you know, and the thing is, is like what's really funny is like you could hear it and you'd be like, well, you know, these guys can like hump out a song and whatever, whatever, whatever. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not how the, that's not their process. No. It's like they're not feeling it like really like organically. It's not happening. No, that's right. No. And so and so I, I mean, so like so all the haters and all the people who like beat on the band and whatever, you cannot say anything about who these guys are and the legacy of what's happening because I'm sorry for f 40 years, these guys have put out great music, like great music. Yep. And they're still going. Yeah, no, really good. Um, and back to you, Michael. So obviously, um, as you said, started off in Everest and, and have had an incredible uh, career in TV and film. What uh, two sort of sub questions. One, what are the highlights for you looking back on that aspect of your career and two, what keeps you excited about it now? So there is nothing cooler than writing a piece of music to a piece of film mm -hmm. and knowing that what you've done has given the picture you're looking at a third or maybe even fourth dimension. Mm -hmm. So you're giving it like an emotional thing. You're giving it a time thing. You're like you're playing into like the character. You're working with the the actor and you're enhancing their performance. So when you do that, there's literally nothing cooler than that. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, that's number one. Number two, um, I, ha I am somebody who is known as a theme guy. So I wrote the music for a show here in America called, called Good Morning America yeah. for ABC, which is a big thing. Uh, I've worked with Oprah. I've done music for, you know, you know, soap operas and other TV shows. I've done, you know, the top of the hour for HBO here in America. I've done the theme for Verizon. I've done the, the theme for Comcast. So so that's that's nice. I, I, I think what keeps me going is I want to feel that I'm evolving. Because yeah. one of the things that I love is hearing a theme and going, wow, now that I've heard this, what could I do with this? Like the last time I had that, like was the first time I heard the theme for like Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah. And I was like, 
God, this is so good. It's so good. And it was so good. Like out of the gate, it was so good. And, and, and it's, and I, I, it's so hard to do that. Like, I mean, to write something that is that succinct and has that sort of like broad sort of cinematic scale that will work in the small confines of watching it on a bloody phone with your headphones yes. on or, or, or you're sitting in a beautiful room, you know, in 4K and, you know, in 5.1. It works both ways, and it's so hard to do that. Oh, oh my goodness! So I, I mean, for myself, like I want to keep challenging myself to say, okay, so can I evolve what I've been doing for the last thirty something years, and and keep myself fresh and new? And here comes the word, David, relevant. <laughs> Because because I think one of the things that happens is that artists say, no, 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 I've got my point of view and I know exactly what I'm going to do. And it's like, yeah, but you're not speaking to the world in a way that's relevant. And so one of the things that I just I recently did was I worked on a movie called Exaltation uh, with a guy named uh, Matthew Diamond, who was a Oscar nominated director and uh, and he gave me a lot of space to do the score uh, and we're going to we're going to find out very soon, you know, like who is going to win the sort of streaming lottery for it in terms of where it's going to show oh, up yeah. in the world. But what's really cool about it is when I see the score, when I see the film, I see how much my sound has evolved and developed over the last 30 years. Yeah. It's very lean now. It's very like, you know, like I'm very specific about things. Like in the old days, it'd be like, okay, so we'll call an orchestra and we'll do stuff. And and I was very much about like sort of like musical gestures. And I wanted everyone to notice who I am. Now I want to be completely transparent yeah. to the story. Yeah. And that's a, and that's that's it. a maturity. Yeah, that's an absolute maturity of approach. Um yeah, that's that's a really important point that you could spend a whole episode talking about it on its own, um, and the process, Michael, and and we we'll do a little bit of geeky gear stuff because um, to say your studio home studio is incredible is an understatement. But what what your process now for composition is obviously um, home based. I mean, are, are there the odd times you're still getting into a a big space with an orchestra, or it's pretty much all computer based for you now? Well, I mean, it, it, it's interesting. It has everything to do with budget and time. Yeah. yeah. So if I have the budget and the time, I'll call players. Uh, what's really interesting is how many players are available online to do your stuff, and then you send stuff back, and then you mix it in. Yeah. So um, having worked in documentaries for such a long time, I can tell you that um, I have – I think every string sample library ever made by anyone. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm exaggerating, but I'm not exaggerating that much. And, and I will tell you that if you write a string part and you send it out to somebody and they do something where they double, triple, quadruple it or whatever, and they put that live point on it, just so you can kind of hear the rosin of the bow mm. sort of, across the sampled strings what a difference that makes yeah. so I, I mean so i think it has a lot to do with how you're writing and the sort of the scope of what you're doing but um the answer is if i have time i always want to call live players yeah yeah because I, because what a player is going to bring to it is something that is so shocking and so surprising, I can't tell you. I'll, I'll give you an example from the new record from from Future Shock. Um, so I sent uh, the song Wonderlust to Simon Phillips, yep. and he listened to it, and he called me because we you know we were doing everything, you know, you know, you know, via yeah. email. We were all cool and whatever. And he called me. He's just like, "What the hell do you want me to do with this?" Yeah. <laughs> I said, "Okay." I said, "Here's the thing. I want." energy and i want color and i want you to do something that's going to make you uncomfortable okay and i said and he's like well why uncomfortable because i'm like i said i said simon every time i've ever seen you play live in person or on video or whatever you always look like you have everything handled yes yes 
and I want you to actually sweat a little bit on this song. And oh my God, David, he like started laughing. He's just like, wait, have, who have you been talking to? <laughs> and I said, wait, I said, I said, I haven't been talking to anybody. I said, I said, David, I, 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 I want you to, Simon, I want you to sweat a little bit. I want you to just to get past that thing you do where you're so prepared. Yeah. And he's like, okay. And you could hear in his voice, he was like, oh, now on a mission. So he sent me back this track that had four snare drums. It had like this little punk sort of like drum kit thing that he was doing. He, he did all this sort of crazy stuff. And I was just like, this is brilliant. That's excellent. This is totally brilliant. So what a live player can bring to something when you give them some space and some direction is it, 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 it's amazing. So that stuff happens on scores. That stuff happens on themes. That stuff happens on recordings. And it, you know, and the thing that I always learned from like listening to, you know, videos with Quincy Jones and you know Arif Mardin and these you know you know you know legendary mm -hmm. producers, I call the right guy for the right job. That's right. And and so I remember. I, this is a this is a firsthand account. The only time I ever saw and I met Arif Mardin for twelve seconds. Okay. He was he was reading the New York Times with his feet up on the console, and there was I mean you know three or four like top New York session players. I can't, I can't name names right out of their thing. And they're like running down this thing and whatever. And he's just sort of reading the paper. Yeah. He's not, he's not directing them. He's not doing anything. And, and so I said, wow, you know, Mr. Medin is, I, it's such an honor. I, the work you've done is so amazing. And I said, what's what I, I just said, you know, just in the second that I have to talk to you, what's the most important thing about producing? And he points to the window and he's like, call the right people. Yeah. And so, you know, if you do that in an Internet context, because we're now working in an Internet context where a lot of producers send stuff out to players and you get stuff back. And so now it's I'm editing the performances and I'm comping what they're doing and I'm doing all that stuff. OK, fine. But what I think the message is you need to call the right people such that you, the producer, will trust that they will show up and they will do their best work. That's right. And do you think, Michael, that I think it's a pretty self-evident question, but do you f feel that that's a huge risk of being lost? I think what's happening a little, I think there's, okay, okay. There's, I think there's two things happening. Number one is I think there's a lot of young producers who don't have the experience of calling trusted players. So what they're doing is they're beating the, 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 the crap out of them and they're making them do too many takes and too many things. And then they're having to like spend a lot of time editing and yeah. comping and auto tuning and all this other kind of stuff. So the performance is really created in the computer. It's not created at the microphone. That's right. And I think, I, and then I think the second thing that's happening is that there is sort of a young contingent of up and coming people who want to be all things to all people, yeah. versus I'm going to pick my lane. Yeah. So if you if you call Tony Levin to play bass, you better want Tony Levin to play bass. Yeah. Because what Tony is going to give you is Tony Levin playing bass. He's not going to pretend he's anyone else other than him. That's right. So like, if you do a song like uh, from my new record, like Hop, Skip and Jump or Poly Jam or any of these things, you listen to it. No one on the planet is going to play that bass part the way Tony nice. does. And so if you you better want what he is doing. So your job as a producer is to absolutely put the players you're hiring in a context where they can absolutely do their best work. Yeah, 
Absolutely. No, it's a great point. And, and I mean, just on that being lost too, I mean, I, I'm just a Weekend Warrior cover band musician. I've had one experience playing with an orchestra that was like a conversion to religion. So it, it feels like unless you've had that experience of sitting in the middle of a, you know, 40, 50 piece orchestra or, you know, um, you're a composer that's never sat in a really great jazz band or a rock band and, and you know, seen that engine room running along, you don't know what you're missing. Well... Yes and no. Yeah, let's. Uh... Yes and no. So I, I, I know this is going to sound weird. So I have done close to a hundred sessions with orchestras. Yeah, yeah. And and so like the sessions that I did for, I, I, you know, I, I don't know how many different like you know jingles and whatever, and you have things and whatever, and like the like the like the session we did for Good Morning America. Like I had 50 of the best players in the country mm. in the same room. Yeah. And so you have like one of these sort of like ridiculous things. And the best part of that session wasn't the recording. It was the afterward because when you do a session in New York City, and this is, by the way, this is like advice for all young people coming up. When you do a session in New York City and you have any more than like two musicians, you better feed them. <laughs> so I had 50 people in a room, so I catered it. So I catered it. I had a catering company and we did the whole thing and they it was food. And, and they were just like, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. Right. And this is the most incredible thing ever. And the people from ABC came down. It, it, it was nice. But – what came out of that conversation were hearing and overhearing all the conversations with all the great people in that room. Yeah. And that was just, and so I think what's being lost now is that community, That's is right. that conversation. So now what's happening is we're all so isolated in our little silo doing our thing. And we, we may call this person and we may call that person, but we don't have that sort of, collegial sort of community thing where people are like both being supportive and they're like, Hey, wow, you're doing this thing. You know, there's this thing coming up next month. You know what? We should talk about this thing. That's right. And so now, you know, cause that's what happened in the nineties. You'd sit there and like all of a sudden people would be talking and talking and things would be happening and be like, okay, cool. And you just go from one session to another session, another session, another session. And it's not like someone booked you for it. It was like someone just told you just show up. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that you're right. That's a radical change, and um, yeah, it'll be interesting over the next five to ten years just how it evolves. Well, I don't know whether it is evolution, but you know how it changes over the next five to ten years. Um, and from one extreme to the other, um, go, your home studio. So from community to when you are doing stuff from home, uh, I, I watched that great um, short doco you did on the making of um, the latest album, and you obviously get plenty of chance to look at your. Uh, home studio. Tell us a little bit about how that evolved. So I have had, okay, so I have been, <laughs> this, David, this is going to be the short confession <laughs> of an ex-minimalist. So, <clears throat> so I have been a composer who had a piano and then I had a, a studio that had 40 keyboards in it. And then I was like, this is crazy. I'm going to get rid of everything. So then I had a computer and a single master controller. Wow. And then I had a couple of things and I got rid of that. And then I've, I've gone through all kinds of different iterations. So now I have a room here in New York City where I have about 16 keyboards in a room that is 12 feet by 10 feet. And uh, so if you go to my website or you, if you go to Michael Whalen Music on Facebook, you can take a look at it. But, but long story short, what I have is a room which is set up for me. Yeah. So one of the things that drives me crazy is that people ask me, hey, how do you do this? How do you do that? And my response is, how do you want to do that? Yeah. Every composer, every creative person has to create their own process to this. So my process is whatever works. So every keyboard in my room can be a master controller to my sequencer. I'm using Logic now. I like it a lot. It's great. But I am not a hardware synthesis purist no. by any stretch of imagination. But I like having... 
the feel of different keyboards under my yeah. fingers. And I think it actually informs the performance. And I, as we were talking before, I think the thing that brings some warmth and some organicness to things is performance. So that's that's number one. Number two, there's no right way to do anything other than how does the music sound when you're done. Yeah. So, like, I have done entire albums, I won't tell you which, I've done entire albums where none of the hardware synthesizers that I have in my room were involved, and it was all done with plugins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so the bottom line is, do what works for you at that moment. And if this is the first time any of the composers who are listening to this have heard that, I am now giving you permission to go do what works for you. <laughs> because because, because the bo- here, here's the bottom line. The bottom line is is that anybody who comes to you and says, I've got the right way to do it, is a liar. Yeah. They're coming from their own point of view. So I do not, Michael Whalen, have the right way to do it. I have what works for me right now in 2021. So if David decides he wants to interview me in three years and I'm saying, well, David, here I am on my desert island and I have my one... (laughs) Or sitting on my, you know, Commodore 64, that's what works for me then. That's right. And you have to actually let yourself evolve to that, and you're going to expand, and you're going to attract, and you're going to do things, and you have to let that happen. And, you know, and from the outside, you'd be like, well, this is crazy. I can't believe it. You, you've got to do one thing forever. That is also bollocks. That's right. I mean, I think the, the, the bottom line here is that you have to let yourself evolve as an artist at that time. Now, if you have been doing something for more than, let's say, let's be generous, five years. Yeah. I have been doing the exact same thing for five years or more, 10 years, 15. I know people who have had the same setup for 20 mm-hmm. years with a you know they're running <laughs> you know whatever the 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 macintosh os was from like 15 years ago you know and you know they they haven't updated anything in their computer and it's you know hey, wow that works come on nah, i don't want to change anything <laughs> okay. so so if you haven't really changed anything that you've done in five years or more i am going to assert the following you know and this is an assertion it's not the truth but the assertion is you might want to look at the possibility that you're making things too comfortable. Mm. So one of the one of the operating quotes that I have in my life that sort of rules me uh, <clears throat> is Eleanor Roosevelt said, "Do one thing a day that scares you." Yeah. And if you're not making music that scares you, or at least when you, after you create it, you're like, I have no idea how I'm going to sell this. Then it's not the right music. Yeah. So when I created Future Shock and everyone was like, wow, what are you going to do with that? I'm like, I have no idea. I'm like, OK, well, then I know this record's a winner. I We're good. That's right. We're, we're, we're ready to rock this thing. So so, I mean, I knew that I was out on the skinny branches musically and a lot of other kinds of ways with Future Shock because I didn't have an easy answer for it. And frankly, I had put together a band with Simon and Tony and my friend Bob Magnuson on sax Mm -hmm. that these guys are so far sort of above my own musical things that I better get my act together or I'm, I can't even play on my own record. So, so, so I mean, it really took a lot for me to be like, okay, here I go. Here we go. We're going to do this now. That said, I mean, you know, Simon and Tony and Bob, they have been incredibly supportive and they've been great about this and it's been great and whatever. But that's not the thing that's going to have you do a great performance. What's going to happen is the fear of failing right. inside of a, a project that you yourself have put together. That's right. Yeah, you always want to be the weakest link in your band is a common piece of advice. And I think that applies here by the sound of it. Amen. Yeah. Um. And, and I'd argue, uh, Mike, I'm, ple- I, I'm sure you won't hesitate to contradict me if I got this wrong, but I think your great insights on, on this stuff is not just coming from your own career as a composer, but also as someone that runs their own record label and has to assess other people's music for inclusion. Um, how, how did that originally come about and, and how much of a passion is that for you at the moment? So uh, it, it, it's a good question. So I signed 
with a new label called Mindstream back in 2019, and I did a record called Cupid Blindfolded, which is a solo piano record. Mm. I love the record. It was terrific. My friend Will Ackerman, who started Wyndham Hill Records, has this beautiful studio in Vermont. I went to Vermont, and I did a solo piano record with my friend Tom Eaton, who engineered it, and um, it was a great experience, and it was great, and I did all this promotion. Um, and then in October of 2019, I got this phone call from Mindstream saying, hey, uh, would you like to be the general manager and the head of A&R for Mindstream? <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, have you guys like moved from like bourbon to heroin? Like, <laughs> like what's happening? It's happening on your end of the phone right now. Like, I don't understand. And they're, they're like, no, 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 no. I'm like, guys, I've never worked for a record company before. They're like, but you have taught music business. You're an expert on copyrights. You have worked in the business for a very, very long time. And you have done a lot of stuff. And you're coming with a fresh point of view. So... November 1st, 2019 was my first day working with Mindstream as a general manager. And over the you know last year and a half, I have learned a lot mm. and it's been a wonderful experience. And we have a lot of things that are about to happen. Um, we have a, uh, a, just to give you guys just sort of a preview. Uh, I mean, we last year we released 15 records. This year we're going to probably do 12 or so. Um, but uh, in September we're doing a collection record. Wow. And so in the last year, I have spent <laughs> nine months on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, not to exaggerate, but I've probably reached out to about 120 people. And, and, for, you know, and there's all kinds of things that happen and whatever. So at the end of the day, so we have 13 artists on this thing that we're calling the Mindstream Collection of Volume 1. It's going to come out on September 24th. Mm. You guys are the very first people on the planet to hear about this. Um, and uh, I'm incredibly proud of what we have put together because we put to the idea was to create an album of instrumental music that was really – what we would call sort of the sound of mindfulness. Yeah. So mainstream is a label that has no genre. You'd be like, well, it's new age, it's ambient. It's like, no, 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 stop all that stuff. Like where we live is we live with how are people actually going to use this music at the yeah. end? Are they going to use it to fall asleep? Are they going to use it to relax? Are they going to use it to meditate? Are they going to use it after a run to recover? Are they going to use it to work or do their homework? Sounds great. So this album is literally like this, what I would call sort of the state of the art of for what mindful music should sound like done by some of the best people on the planet. So uh, just to give you guys just sort of a, an idea of who we're talking about, we're talking about Daniel Lanois. Yeah. Is on, he does a, he does a guitar track. If you guys don't know Daniel, he's produced uh, Peter Gabriel and U2 right. and a bunch of other people. Daniel has also done, a series of beautiful solo recordings nice. and Daniel, one of the best guitar players on the planet. Mm. And he did a, in a David, he did the, in a single pass, he did this thing on pedal steel and processing. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard in my life. Wow. Yeah. So, um, we got Mark Isham, who is maybe my favorite composer of all time. Yeah. It's John Williams. There's John Barry and Thomas Newman, but Mark might edge out everybody. Um, Mark did a record in 1987 called Vapor Drawings, right. which is which is literally the most important recording in my life. Yeah. And getting Mark on this was so important to me. He did, he did a classic Mark track. I was so happy. We got uh, Gustavo Santiago, who, if you don't know who that is, he did the music for a movie called Brokeback Mountain. He did a music. He did music for a movie called uh, Bobble, and he won Academy Awards for both. Yeah. And Gustavo is a unbelievable guitarist. Like I, he's not good. He's like literally like next level, whatever. Mm. And the track is unbelievable. Uh, there's a couple of other people on there. There's a guy. I, I don't know, David. Maybe I, maybe you've heard of him. There's a guy named Rick Wakeman. I don't know. Oh, no. Uh, he's not that tr um, guy that tries to take off that real player in the cape, is he? Or is he? The, he's the, yeah, no, I know. Like, sort of, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. There was a band like called Yes or something. Yeah, something I don't like know. That. 
something like that. Anyway, so uh, so I was incredibly uh, honored to work with Rick. Yes. Rick was, Rick is uh, an incredible influence on me, and Rick is a character in real life, and his music is wonderful. Jordan Rudess, who is the keyboard yes. player for Dream Theater, is a is a is a good friend of mine. I was so happy he was available for this. He did a beautiful track for this. And then another one of my all-time favorite um, uh, film composers, Cliff Martinez, did a beautiful ambient track for this. So, um, so there's going to be a lot more coming, but I, this is just a little teaser for the Mindstream yeah. collection. Can't wait. Um, and just as a recasa, I want to talk a little bit more about Mindstream as well. But um, as a recasa, I know you said you, you'd spend time on social media. I think Rick Wakeman has one of the funniest Twitter accounts I've ever followed. Ever, yeah. Ever, like I don't, I don't think people understand how funny he is. If you, if in one, if I, if you want one Rick Wakeman link to to click on, look at Rick Wakeman's acceptance speech to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll link to that in the show so, notes. So Rick does four or five minutes, and literally, like the audience is astonished at where he goes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and you're just like, oh my god, I can't believe he's saying this, and it's really funny. And so, like, I I think if Rick was like a failed keyboardist, which he'd never be because he's no. unbelievable, but but if he had failed, he probably should have been a stand-up comedian. And because I wondered he's, if some of it was intentional, Michael. So I wondered. So some of his tweets are so banal, but they're funny at the same time. Like, I yeah. my co-host Paul, who wasn't able to join us tonight i mean i constantly take screenshots of rick's tweets and send them on to him because it's like got up walk dog um you know bowels playing up today I, I, he hasn't said that you know stuff like and i just go that's just amazing <laughs> yeah no no but i mean but see but here's the thing he will do that deadpan english thing and then he will say something completely outrageous yes, yeah and you're like okay so which one of these two are, is, are supposed to be funny and the answer is both that's right that's pretty shiva. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and back to Mindstream. So um, I can imagine you said you released 12, 4, you know, records and, and so on. I can imagine the demand as, as an A&R uh, involved on the A&R side of things. You must get, what, hundreds of submissions a year or? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think one of the things that we want is we want artists to be thinking about music with no genre. Yeah. Which is tough. Because I think radio people, and I say this with love and respect to people like you, I think what happens is, especially in the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s, I think we were all programmed into what genre, yeah. what pigeonhole are you going to try to put yourself? Now it's what playlist, what mood, you know, like in a, in a world where people want music for a non-musical outcome on a playlist – now where does your music fit? And I think for a lot of older art, uh, uh, artists, like let's call them like plus forty five years old, that's a really tough conversation. Is, yeah, yeah, a good conversation though, one that I think we will get th through. But yeah, it's it's a challenge. Yep. Um, but it's obviously been successful, and as you said, the purpose of the music is more important than trying to put it in a box. So, um, that's brilliant. Um, and. So, Michael, we'll go into the, the big um, last set of questions, and I feel like I barely scratched the surface, but that's always the risk in an hour podcast. Um, let's talk about your train wreck, and I know it's a little bit different um, when you aren't quite doing as much live work as far as on a stage in front of an audience, but I'm sure you've had some fun train wrecks to report. Train wreck? Yeah, I mean, you know... <sighs> Well, I mean, my favorite train wreck story report to you will probably be studio ones. Mm. So a studio train wreck was, uh, so um, uh, Maurice Jarre, the uh, yeah. famous film composer, you know, he did, you know, uh, uh, Lawrence of Arabia and uh, Dr. Zhivago and a few other things. So uh, a friend of mine from um, PBS, the public broadcasting here in the, the United States, said, well, um, Maurice is recording a new theme and he needs a synthesizer player. And, you know, I thought of you and, oh, by the way, you need to be there in 20 minutes. <laughs> and I said, well, is there an instrument there? And they were, he was like, well, no. And I'm like, well, then what the hell am I bringing? Yeah. 
So I grab a Profit 5 and I throw it under my arm and I jump in a cab literally and I go down to the studio and, you know, here's Maurice and the 65-piece orchestra, half of which I know because they've all been yeah. on sessions with me. And they're all like, hey, Michael, what's up? What are you doing, man? What's up? <laughs> and uh, and Maurice said, um, so you're the synthesizer player? You know, he has this very French kind of thing. And he wants to be this. And I said, uh, yeah, sure, I, I, do you have a chart? He's like, no, I have no chart for this. Uh, I need someone who's going to be able to sort of interpret what is happening and then play along with the orchestra. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, seriously. So I, I said, well, I'll listen and I'll, I'll, I'll see what's happening. And as you're rehearsing the orchestra, he's, he's like, this is New York city. We're not rehearsing. We're, we're recording That's now. Right. Like, and I'm like, but I, but I have never heard this before. <laughs> and you have no chart for me. And he's like, well, here you go. And so he hands me a, a terrible Xerox copy of the score. And so, like, now I'm looking at a score that I've never looked at before, and they're like, oh, here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> so there's train wreck one, number one. <clears throat> and it took me about three and a half takes to kind of, like, get in and sort of, like, find my thing. Yeah. Which New York City is a really long time. It would be. So in New York City, what happens is – you put sheet music in front of everybody. You say to everybody, okay, does anybody have any questions? There's silence, and you go, okay, now we record, and you're done. Yeah. So however long it takes you to get from, like, point A to point B to the end of it, you're done. There's no rehearsal. You're not having a, con you're not having a conversation about interpretation or dynamics or any of that other, like, you know, you know stuff. You're done. Because you're literally in a room with the best musicians on the That's planet. Right. Okay, so here I am, you know, help, you know, you know, helpless, hapless guy with a profit five going, ah. <laughs> so, you know, so to do something with three takes was just like, you know, so at, at a certain point when we got when we got it done, he was finally like, what you did was really nice. I uh, thank you. Yeah. I'm like, you know, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't care if you're famous. I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> That's it's like, oh, my God. So that that's train that's train wreck number one, um, train wreck number two. Oof, I think would be something along the lines of. Oh, okay, so this is we're now we're going to reach way back, David. <laughs> so back, I, I was born in New York City, but I grew up in Washington mm. D.C. and in the sort of late 70s into the 80s in in Washington DC like there was a music that was created called go go music and if anyone doesn't have any idea what go go music is if you don't have never heard it before uh Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers uh Experience Unlimited EU um if you don't know what any of that stuff is listen to an album called Slave to the Rhythm by Grace Jones oh, yeah. produced yep. by Trevor Horn so the drummers from EU flew from Washington DC to England and recorded with Grace yeah. so and that was amazing so i was in a music store in Washington and i'm playing keyboards and Chuck Brown was looking over my my shoulder and he's just like he said this he's like you know for a white boy, you pretty funky. <laughs> but you know what you need? You need some more time to understand what funk really is. Yeah. You, should, you should hang out with us. And so I'm 15 years old. Wow. And I got to spend an entire summer playing with Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers. That doesn't get much better. And than that. I mean, and that three months or so changed my entire life. Would have, yeah. So, I mean, because what Chuck, the, the band was enormous. There was 13, 14 people in the band. There's four percussionists. There's a, a whole thing. But, but what being in that band taught me was two things. Number one is, where is the pocket? Mm. So, because I think, I mean, you know, and I think a lot of black musicians tease white musicians about this because, you know, white musicians are so on top of things. And, like, how to, like, push back 
on where the pocket is such that things really like feel right. Yeah. We're not talking about tempo. We're talking about where the emphasis of the beat is. That's right. So what Chuck what Chuck taught me was how to play off the beat such that it felt right at any tempo. Mm. And like that changed my life. The second thing was what you need to play versus what is needed. So what you need to play is your ego. That's right. So what you need to play is a lot of notes and you want to get the spotlight and you want everyone to go, oh, my God, Michael, you're the most amazing keyboard <laughs> player I've ever heard in my entire life. What's needed is about 10 percent of that. Yeah. And that also changed my life. So, like, how do you play in such a way where it's only what the song needs? It's only what the rhythm needs. It's only what the performance needs. It changed my life. Totally changed my life. So, so the the train wreck part of it was pretty much the first three weeks I was in the band. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, ah, God, I'm just playing too much, and I'm like this crazy white kid, and I'm trying to prove myself. And at a certain point, Chuck just said, Chuck just said, "You're fine. Just calm down." Yeah. And 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 by the end, like like you know, like like minutes would go by, and I'd play a single chord. Yeah. And then I'd. And then my hand would come up and he'd look at me and he'd give me the thumbs up. And he's like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's like, he's like, that's all you need. Yeah. Music and, and, and it's like when you watch like Miles Davis play with those bands from the eighties and you see how little those guys are doing and, and, and how, and how much of it was informed by like, how do I, it's not about what are you doing? It's about what is needed at the that's time. Right. The answer was always less and less and less and less and less. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously the cliche is always like less is more and less is more yeah, and yeah. less is more. Fine. But, you know, but when you were in that moment in front of 4,000 people, because Chuck would play these huge things and everyone cheering and you've got your adrenaline going, you know, when you've got your adrenaline going, can you still be that focused and disciplined? That's right. Yeah. That's that's the key. Yeah. No, that's a brilliant train wreck and um, example of some of the best music education you can receive uh, your first three weeks there with Chuck. Yeah, that's brilliant. Just amazing. I'm just wonderful. And if you guys don't know Chuck Brown, check it out, Go-Go Music. But seriously, if you want to understand like what Go-Go Rhythm is, listen to what Trevor Horn did with Slave to the Rhythm. It's absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, Trevor Horn. What, yeah, what an icon. Oh, uh, oh my God. Um all right, last two questions quickly, Michael, because I know you have to go. Um, tag a keyboard player. If you could hear someone else on the podcast, you, you, um, who would it be? Ooh. Um, you know who my, like, favorite sort of, like, new guy on the scene is? Is uh, the guy from Kansas, Tom Brislin. Oh, yep, yep. Um, Love him. Great. Um, great, very musical guy. And what I love about what Tom does is he honors the sort of the legacy of this incredible band, Kansas, and he brings his own thing to it. Yeah, great. No and, and, and so Tom would definitely be on my list. Excellent. Uh, and Desert Island Disc, Michael, I know I, I gave you a slight heads up or you'd already heard it. So um, no, what are your five you albums? Know, yeah, so I'm ready to go. I'm ready, I'm ready to rock here. So... Um, so my five Desert Island discs. Okay, so this is – okay, here we go. <laughs> I got to commit. I'm going to commit. Okay. So Desert Island disc number one is Earth, One and Fire, Greatest Hits, Volume 1. Oh, nice. Uh, second one is Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Works, Volume 1. Great. Uh, third disc is uh, Genesis, Duke. Superb, yep. Uh, fourth disc would be Boz Skaggs, Silk yeah. Degrees. And the fifth would be uh, Toto 4. Nice. Yeah. Amazing. Um, just as a side of you, have you um, listened or read Steve Lukather's biography? You probably know a lot of it anyway, but that's... Absolutely. Yeah, incredible. Uh, yeah. And, and I, and, uh, you know, I'm an I'm enormous Toto fan, and I was there in Philadelphia on their quote-unquote last show in october of uh, 2019 wow. and uh i mean you know and I, I i 
you know, I know Steve Picaro and, you know, I, I, I worship at the altar that is Steve. Yes. Because, I mean, what's funny, when you talk to Steve, he's like, you know, I don't understand, like, what the big deal yes. is. And I said, and, I, and I'm, I'm like, Steve, listen to me very carefully, okay? Um, you know, his solo record from 2016 is one of my favorite albums of all time. Yeah. And there's a song on there called Painting by Numbers. Yes. Which, when you listen to the harmony is the absolute like encapsulation of Steve Picaro as a person. I mean, yes, you could talk about human nature and Michael Jackson and you could talk about the things he's done and you could talk about all that stuff. But when, we, but when you listen to painting by numbers, what you're hearing is both like the emotional sort of compassionate thing and him saying, Hey, you know what? I'm going to tell the story in such a way, but I'm not going to make it too big. And I'm telling you as a songwriter, like having that kind of discipline and focus makes all the difference. Oh. Yeah. oh my God. No, incredible. And so when, I, when I, when I listen to his stuff and I'm like, Steve, dude, like you ride this rail, you are walking this tightrope that like most artists would fall on. And you do this thing, which is like, like so few people can do that. That's right. And then, you got to look to the other side of the stage and you've got a guy like David Page yes. who's like laying down like these 10 finger chords and he's doing this stuff and you're doing all of this like super, super disciplined stuff. And the contrast between the two of you guys is unbelievable. It is. It's a hell of a chemistry. We had the pleasure it's of spending an hour with Steve on episode 30 and you, you're exactly right. You can tell that he doesn't see what the fuss is. He's so laid back about it all. It's incredible. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm like, hi, you're a Dumbo. Like, what are you talking about? It's like, I mean, like, I, I'm like, I, I'm sorry. Like, I can listen to Isolation, and you get a master class in how to create sounds for a pop band. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. End of story. But I also feel, oh, Michael, we've had a master class. Oh, my. Sorry. Yeah, and, and then, then then you listen to Fahrenheit, and oh, by the way, you guys do a song. You do an instrumental song with Miles Davis. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. What's the big deal? I'm so I'm like, look. So I said, Steve, I love you, but if this is literally fake modesty, when I see you, I will literally punch That's you in right. the face. That's right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Rightfully so. Um, and between Steve and Miles Davis has been examples of master classes. I'd still argue that we've had a master class in a whole bunch of really useful areas today. So I can't thank you enough, Michael, for taking the time. And um, I think we will be annoying you again because there's some areas I'd love to cover with you that we didn't have time to today. And, and David, I, I would be happy to anytime. No, thank you. And um, so, yeah, lovely to have you on the, the show. Um, it's yeah been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank, and thank you to everybody for listening. Check out Future Shock. Check out, you know, you know, all you know, David's other episodes. And I'm very, very grateful for being here. So there we have it. Um as I promised in the introduction, that was one broad-ranging discussion. Uh, watch this space. Um, Patreon uh, supporters in particular for a special bonus uh, section of, of the interview on the digital rights and copyright law stuff. It, it makes for a fascinating conversation and we've got that lined up for the near future. Um, but yeah, huge thank you to Michael. Um, that was an incredible learning experience for me and I hope um, you got as much value out of it as, as I did. Um, so yeah, absolutely brilliant. Um, so otherwise we'll be back again in two to three weeks, but just a reminder that you can keep in touch via a few means. Um, our website is www.keyboardchronicles.com. Uh, and just as an example, a huge thanks to Pete in the UK for a lovely email, um, just in the last 24 hours, um, saying how much he enjoyed the Veronica Lewis interview last episode. Um, and Pete, as I've responded to you via email, um, we had a ball, um, discussing um, Veronica's burgeoning career and we certainly will be going down that route in the future with upcoming artists. So yeah, really appreciate your lovely feedback. Um, we're also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash keyboard chronicles or on Twitter at the keyboard chr1. If you like good old fashioned email, always keen to hear from you at editor at keyboard chronicles.com. 
If you would like to become an official supporter, we have a Patreon account where for the price of a coffee a month, you can help us go from strength to strength and start to get some little bonus snippets from our highly valued guests. So that uh, website address is patreon.com forward slash keyboard chronicles. Uh, a huge thank you um, to you for joining me again this episode. Uh, it's why we do what we do and, and really appreciate you listening. So hope to see you back here next episode. <laughs>